We're continuing a, our walk through the Gospel of John, and today I've, I've titled today's message, Breaking Through Barriers to Be Born Again. And so we're going to be in John chapter 3 in the first 15 verses, and as we step into this, most of us know that this encounter that we're going to come in contact with, literally, Jesus spoke the most memorized and remembered verse in the Bible. If you were to ask pretty much anyone what is one verse of the Bible they know, most people are going to say John 3.16. And, and so next week, Kyle's going to be sharing about that. This week, I'm in the beginning of the story because we're going to focus in upon the person that Jesus had this conversation with. And, and there's a key verse I want us to begin with, and it's found in John chapter 3, verse 3. And as Jesus is talking to this man we're going to meet today, he says this, as Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what Jesus says here is of utmost importance to every person who has ever lived. In the American church today, there is uh, considered to be, in the, in, in the Christian um, in America, there, there is this considered this sect called the born-again Christians. And maybe you've heard that said before, as though there are some Christians who aren't born again. Now, let me just clarify this. Jesus made it very clear. There is not going to be a single person in heaven who has not been born again. I don't care if you were christened as a baby, if you've been baptized in water, if you walked an aisle in a Baptist church, Jesus says there is one condition. It's that you must be born again. And so this morning, we're going to step into this because I want us to understand what exactly Jesus is talking about. And so as we come to this term, born again, what is it that we're looking at? And so let me just give you this statement is kind of make sure we get this because this is really what it means to be that we're talking about today to be born again. Being born again is a transformation into a new creation. Being born again is a transformation. It is not a gathering of information. It is not an agreeing to information. It is a transformation in becoming a new creation. And so as we come to this this morning, we're going to be stepping into the story. Now, before we do, I think it is imperative for us, every one of us in here, to, to first understand what is really being talked about here, okay? And so as we come to it, let me just try to help you with something. Whenever the gospel of John was originally written by John, there were no chapters. You know, whenever we sometimes read the Bible, we read going into the next chapter like in a book, we're going to a new chapter. But that is not the way he wrote it. As a matter of fact, if you were to read and see the original text, you would see that, first of all, not only is it not divided into chapters, it's not divided into verses, and no punctuation in it. It is all simply the Word of God just written in there. And they have it all across there. And so as you're reading it, we need to understand that the end of John chapter 2 and the beginning of John chapter 3 go together. They are contextually the same story. Now, why do I say that? Well, let me read the last three verses of John chapter 2 because I want you to see this. It says, now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in a man. Now, again, this is at the Passover. Remember a couple of weeks ago, Kyle shared the story about Jesus turning over the tables. And, and in that time, as he's there during that Passover feast, as he's there with the people, he begins teaching and begins performing various signs of healings and, and miracles and casting out demons. And, and as he's doing this, people are seeing these signs. And as they're seeing these signs, they're saying, he's him. I'm believing in him. I believe he's the one. I believe he's exactly the one. As a matter of fact, it says in this passage that many believed 
in his name. Now, let me just say something about that. That is the term that's actually used in the Scripture for salvation many other places. And so you would think that in this, it says many believed in his name, that there Jesus would be excited. He'd be elated. He'd be pumped because, man, they're getting it. But what is his response? Listen to what his response is in verse 24. It says this, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. What does it mean to entrust himself? It means this, is that Jesus didn't give them himself. He didn't give them, he didn't trust them with himself. So let me just talk about that. In other words, they believed in him, but he knew what their heart was doing. He knew what was going on in their heart. And so as we come to this, I hope that you see this and understand this. So there's two basically key questions that I want us this morning to ask ourselves. And the first question that I want us to ask ourselves is this, has Jesus entrusted himself to you? Has he entrusted himself to you? Not have you trusted him, but has he entrusted himself? That's an important question. That is an eternally important question. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just kind of say it this way. Does the life of God live inside of you? Does the life of God live inside of you? That's the question that we need to be asking ourselves today. You may say that you know him, that you believe in him. Many of you probably are here saying, well, well I've given him my life. Have you really? Has he, the key question is, has he given you his? Jesus, earlier in Matthew chapter 7, we, we read where he talks about that moment, that day of when, when he's going to be there and people are going to come in judgment and they're going to stand before him. And he says this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, does it? Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, look at this, I never knew you. There's a form of Christianity in America that is leading millions to hell. It's the idea that I've, I've gone through the duty, I've gone through the stuff, I've done the things. What are you asking of me, preacher? It's not what I'm asking. It's what God's asking. It's what God requires. This is why people can say they're going to continue to live a lifestyle that is completely foreign to the Word of God and yet say they're a Christian because they don't have the life of God in them. That's the difference. And we need to know that. And so that brings me to the next question I want us to ask ourselves, and it's simply this. How do you know if Jesus has entrusted himself to you? How can you know that? We're going to see that today. Today we're going to meet this man, and as we meet him, he meets literally all the qualifications that people of his day would have said, he's a shoe-in. I mean, if anybody's going to be in heaven, it's going to be Nicodemus. I mean, he was considered the most righteous, the most knowledgeable, the most fervent about his faith. And yet we're going to see him have an encounter with Jesus and him be asked that very same question. It says this in John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. Now, we, we look at that as a bad term, but the reality was he was the most fervent. Man, they believed the Word of God front to back. They believed everything in it. They wanted to follow everything God required. They believed they were trying to follow God more than anybody. I mean, they, they were taking the, the, the Word of God and all the 600 plus laws that are in the Scriptures, and they were going, okay, I, I want to make sure we're doing them. And then before long, what began to happen was, well, Okay, we need to 
understand what does it mean on certain these? How do we know if we're meeting them? For instance, the one was, that is most often talked about in the New Testament is that, that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so they begin talking, okay, what is work? And what, what is it? What constitutes work and what is not work? And so they had all kind of different rules that they had. And one of them that they literally had was they had a rule that, that if a man took a rope and he tied a knot in it, that was considered work. He, you can't, so you can't tie knots in ropes. But then that brought a problem because the women, they would wear sashes and they tied a knot. And so they, they said, well, a woman can tie a knot in their sash because that's not work, but you can't, a man can't tie a knot in a rope. And then comes up the problem. The man goes out to draw water for that morning and it's, it's right there at his home and and he goes to draw water, and the bucket is not tied to the rope. So what does he do? Well, they decided, well, if he goes and gets his wife's sash, <laughs> this is literally what they did. He wraps a rope around it and ties a knot with the sash, he's good. He can get water. Now, I know for us that sounds ridiculous, but let me tell you, we do many of the same things. We, we have them painted in a different color, but we do many of the same things. Well, Brother David, I know I'm going to heaven, but I've been going to church. I, I teach a Sunday school class. Well, Brother David, I mean, I don't, you know, it's, we used to always say it this way, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't date the girls that do. I mean, it was kind of like, man, I'm in. <laughs> it's this guy. He was a Pharisee. Not only was he a Pharisee, he was a ruler of the Jews. What did that mean? That meant that they had a group. They were called the Sanhedrin. There were 70 rulers of the Jewish people. He was one of the 70 most influential Jews in all the world at that time. Not only that, but later on in the story, Jesus calls him the teacher of the Jews. So now he is the teacher of the 70 of all the people. That's the man who comes to Jesus. And so I want you to listen to this again, but I want to read the last part of, verse 20, of, of chapter 2 again and then the first verse of 3 just so you get the context. It says this, beginning of verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man. Did you hear that? That's the context of this of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So to make this point abundantly clear of what it means to be born again, Jesus talks to the man who everyone thought was a shoe in And he tells him, you've not been born again. So as we come to this, I want us to see and realize that Nicodemus was not ready. Why was he not ready? Well, I'm going to show you this morning four barriers that was keeping him from being born again. And so we're going to come to the first one in this passage here. I just call the, the first barrier is the barrier of reputation. And so as we come to this, let me just start with the story in John 3. We're going to go through, and we're going to get to meet Nicodemus a little bit today. And whenever we walk from this place, we're going to be able to see that, you know what, he was like one of us in some ways, and yet he wasn't born again. It says this, beginning in chapter 3, verse 2, it says, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the, these signs that you do unless, he is, is, unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, Nicodemus was a curious seeker. He was seeking for that. He was watching Jesus perform these miracles, and he wasn't getting mad at him. He was just saying, only God can do that kind of stuff. Only God can be using this. There's something here that is there. But you see, he also had a reputation. I mean, he was a somebody. He would have been one that everybody would have looked up to. He was one that everybody thought had it together. And he didn't, uh, he didn't want to put himself in jeopardy by openly in the marketplace one morning just say, hey, Jesus, I have a question for you. Would you just tell me? I know that you have to be from God. You see, that would have messed him up because Jesus already caused a lot of problems and had already uh, frustrated many of the religious leaders. He believed that he was doing those signs by God, but he wasn't ready to go public with what he was believing. 
What was he fearful of? Well, I just say this, that Nicodemus' fear was he was fearful of what people, what will people think? Did you know why some of us stay quiet about our faith? We think it's okay. But we stay quiet about our faith. You see, he came at night. Whenever John uses that term night, it's used in both physical and and spiritual. It's a picture of coming in darkness. It's coming and cloaking himself so he wouldn't be found out. And, and we want to stay incognito. And he says, yeah, that's not how you come to me. You see, he said, you must be born again. You must begin like everybody else, Nicodemus. Your reputation doesn't matter. Your education doesn't matter. Your sophistication doesn't matter. That you're the greatest teacher in Israel, it doesn't matter. You have to come like everybody else. You must be born again. There's no such thing as somebody being born again and and remaining in hiding. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus said this, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men... I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. There is a clear delineation between those who are in heaven and those who aren't. Again, ask yourself, has Jesus entrusted himself to me? Do I have the life of God in me? So the first barrier is the barrier of reputation. The second barrier we're going to come into in Nicodemus's life is a barrier of confrontation. It's the struggle that all of us have. We're going to come in to to meet Nicodemus later on in chapter 7, and this is another one of the festivals that the Jewish people had. They had the Passover festival uh, that we're going to be coming to up in, we call it Easter now, and then there was Pentecost was another time, and then there's the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Shelters. And so it was at this festival that, that Jesus again shows up, and Nicodemus has some issues that he's trying to work through. We see that, that what would happen is, is it would be a week-long celebration, and every morning the people would go out and they would walk in this line. They would go out to this, uh, this place called Gihon Springs or Gihon Springs. And they would take, one of the priests would take a bucket, a pitcher, a golden pitcher, and he would dip down in the springs and he would get water and they would walk back. And as they were walking back, they would begin singing, the people would begin singing Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, that says this, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And as they would pour it out, they would be reminded about the the rock that, that water came gushing from. And so on the last day of this, the great day, as they were there and they had done this again, and now this was the one everybody was gathered there in this celebration moment. It was in this place that as people are kneeling and bowing and, and rejoicing that God was the, what was the well of salvation, Jesus stands up and shouts with everything in him. And he says in John chapter 7, verses uh, 37 through 39, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because the, Jesus had not yet been glorified. As, as Nicodemus is there in the crowd, and he's hearing this, I can just imagine, he, all of a sudden he's taken back to that, that time, that encounter that he had personally with Jesus. And as he goes back to that, Jesus had said some things that began to come back into his mind, I believe. And we see in John chapter 3, back in that, verses 4 through 8, it says this, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said, listen to this, you must be born again. You just think about what he just did. He looked at Nicodemus, the most righteous man in Jerusalem, and says, you must be born again. The one who was following all Scripture, you must be born again. 
The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I can just imagine as, as he was looking into Jesus' eyes, and Jesus was saying that to him, it was bringing a conviction. Oh, he had gone with a reputation, but now he's struggling with, okay, how do I say this? What do I do? As Jesus was there on that, in that, that feast of booths, and his, he had just said that, the religious leaders are just absolutely losing their mind. They send their, their, uh, their guards that they had with them. They sent them out to go and, and to arrest him. But those guards, when they went and heard him teach, they said, man, we never heard anybody talk like this guy. And they are irate. They can't believe it. And Nicodemus takes a risk. And he says this in, in John chapter 7, verse 50. It says, Nicodemus who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? In other words, he's saying, I think, I think, we, need to, I think we need to listen, but listen to the response he got back. They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. What was his fear that he was struggling with? His fear that he was struggling with, with was what will people say? I mean, I mean, I... I I'm worried about what they think, but what are they going to say if I say, hey, you know, I think, I, I think this Jesus is the real deal. I think there's something real here. I need to look at this. I need to see this. And so he had, a, he had another barrier he had to break through. He's, he's like, I mean, I, 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 I'm worried about my reputation, but man, I don't know that I, I really want to go through the pains of confrontation whenever I say, hey, I think Jesus may be the Messiah. But that brings us to a third barrier in his life. I call it the barrier of rejection. This is the one that most of us stumble on. You see, when you're born again, you're going to lose some friends. You're going to be rejected by some people that you think love you the most. You're going to have people turn their back on you. And so, let me just tell you what's in us. It's in every one of us. I got it. You got it. We all have it. And this is what it is. It's this idea that I want to come to Jesus on my terms. Okay, Brother David, I don't, I don't think that way. Yeah, we do. We all do. I did. We all do. We say it like this. Okay, they told me that I need to walk an aisle. I need to pray a prayer. I need to go be dunked in some water. I need to be reading my Bible. I need to be doing something. I'm going to do these things as long as I can continue to live the way I want to. As long as I can still call the shots, or as I've said so many times, as long as I still have a vote in the way I live. Now, let me just tell you, if you want to see some religious people get mad, every time I said that for years, I've made some hacked off. Because religious people still think They can do what they want. And now he's at a place where the fear he has now is the fear of rejection. We're entering into the final week of Jesus. And as we enter into this final week of Jesus, this now comes to another Passover. This was the week that he was taken to the cross. And as we come to this, Jesus, as we know on what we're going to be celebrating in just a few weeks, is going to be Palm Sunday. And he came riding in on a donkey. He did that to fulfill Scripture because the Messiah, when he comes into Jerusalem, will come riding on a donkey, was the prophet that that spoke that. And so Nicodemus, as he sees Jesus on purpose coming in that way and people crying out to him and singing hallelujahs to him and laying palm branches before him, he knows Scripture is being fulfilled. You see, this was the teacher of Israel. This was a man who had memorized all of the Scripture. He knew what was happening. But at the same time, the other Pharisees who are with him are in a panic because things are just going haywire. They don't know what to do. They are struggling with what's going to happen. And so they came out with some harsh laws. Here was the laws that came out. This is the declaration they had made. We find it in John chapter 12, verses 42, 43. It says, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. That's Nicodemus. 
But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Their reputation was winning out, just like we all struggle with. Are you saying if I get saved, I've got to change? Are you saying if I get saved, I can't continue to live the way that I want to? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Well, wait a second. Now, I've got some friends of mine that, that at their church, they say that, you know what, as long as I'm a good person, yes, as long as you're a good person, you'll go to hell. I know that sounds awful. I know that some are offended, especially in our so offended culture. But I would rather offend you here and God bring the conviction of the Spirit and you give your life and are born again than to not, not offend you here and you stand before God and He said, depart from me. I never knew you. So just listen. Jesus is trying to help a man who is so bound up in his religion. He doesn't know what to do. What was his fear? Well, his first fear we looked at was what will people think. Second was what people th- say. But in this third one that we come to, it is simply this, what will people do? If I say I've given my life to Christ, you don't know what that means. I remember years ago whenever I had a Jewish friend, I've told you about him before. His name's Danny, and, and, and he told me. He stood there with tears streaming down. He knew Jesus was the Christ. He knew that he was the only hope of salvation. And he looked at me and he says, but Brother David, if I give my life to Jesus, my wife will leave me. My children will abandon me. My family will disown me. And I looked at him in love and said, then you've got a choice to make. And right there, he knelt weeping, and gave his life to Christ. You see, many of us are worried about, well, what will people do if I do this? What will people do? And that brings me to the last one. Let me give you this last one. These barriers are real simple. Reputation, the barrier of reputation, the barrier of confrontation, the barrier of rejection, and then this last one is simply this, the barrier of declaration. This is what holds most people from truly being born again. Now, again, we're continuing this this last week, Jesus in this last week. We started there early on, and and Nicodemus is struggling, and he wants to to become and and just confess, I've given my life to him. But you see, he's going to be kicked out of the city. He's going to lose his reputation. He's going to lose his family. He's going to lose his position. He's no longer going to be able to teach. He's going to lose everything. But as the week progresses, The other religious leaders, they take and they arrest Jesus. And then they begin beating him. And then they take him before the Romans. And and even Pilate himself said, I just, I don't think we need to to do this. And they started crying out, do it, do it. And finally, as they cried out, crucify him enough, he gave in. As Nicodemus is watching, I imagine, just think about this. Jesus is stumbling toward Calvary. As he comes to Calvary, and you hear those nails pounding in his hands. And then he gets lifted up. I'm sure in that moment, Nicodemus in that moment is suddenly reminded again of all the way back in John chapter 3 whenever he was talking with Jesus and he was trying to understand because Jesus had said to him in John chapter 3 verses 14 and 15, Jesus said this, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him has eternal life. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. And suddenly Nicodemus is watching the Son of Man lifted up. 
And everything starts flooding into his heart and into his spirit as he's watching this. He's seeing these things. He's overwhelmed by what's happening. I'm sure that in this, he is beginning to watch and think through everything and begins to be reminded of a prophetic word that was given through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, it says, Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. As, as he's looking, he's being reminded and being blown away. It's him. It's him. It's him. What am I holding back? Why am I staying back? Why am I worried about my reputation? As he continues on just thinking about that. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And as he's watching this, and as he's seeing this played out in front of him, Nicodemus is overwhelmed. And then I can just imagine as he's standing there, and as he's watching, and he hears Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, many of us read that and go, oh, does he think God's forsaken him? Nicodemus knew exactly what was happening. You see, he was a master of the Scriptures. He knew that Jesus was wanting everybody to know, go to Psalm chapter 22. Go to Psalm chapter 22. You're going to see what is really going on here. And immediately Nicodemus' mind all of a sudden goes there. And in verse 7 it says, all who see me mock me. In verse 16 of Psalm 22, it says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. In verse 18, it says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. As he watches the Roman soldiers casting lots, he knows there's God. That's the king. He's doing what he said he was going to do. It all came flooding in. How do we know this? Because when Jesus cried out, it is finished. Listen to what happens at the next part of the story in John 19, verses 38 through 40. It says, after these things, after he cries out, after he says, it is finished, it is accomplished, I have done what you sent me to do. After these things, the Bible says to us, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, look at this, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away the body. Look at the next verse. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night. See, he had come by night in hiding, now in the daylight. He comes. It says, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now let me just say this real quick in closing, because I want you to get this, about what it means to be born again. The 75 pounds of spices is very important. Because it is the public declaration of Nicodemus. You see, whenever it says, well, the custom of the Jews was that they would wrap them in linen cloth and put spices on them, it was, but not 75 pounds. 75 pounds of spices was unbelievably expensive. As a matter of fact, among the Jews, to bury someone with 75 pounds of spices meant this. It meant that we are burying royalty. Nicodemus said, the king, the king just died. I'm going to give him a royal burial. Jesus had entrusted himself to Nicodemus. He was born again. This morning, what's holding you back? I can tell you for me, I was a lot like Nicodemus. And I grew up in church. My dad's a preacher. 
And I, was, I grew up in a good home. I went to church all the time. I wasn't one of them preacher's kids that you kind of go, oh, there's one of the preacher's kids. I wasn't that. Went to a Christian college. Made an A in New Testament. Man, I got to be a shoe in. When I was nine years old, I went down, talked to my mom and dad. And they took me to two different seminary professors to let them talk to me about, is, is this real? And, and, and I went and, and they said, I, we believe that this is real, that he knows what he's doing. I was baptized, a good kid, Christian college, prayed at times, you know. But there was this something in here that said, there's something not there. I had the life of God around me. I didn't have the life of God in me. And at 22 years old, I've told you this so many times, but this is why this story so resonates with me, and this is my burden for us. I remember sitting back, about two-thirds back on an aisle seat, and the Spirit of God saying to me, in a moment like this, if you walk out without giving me your life, you're walking out a lost man. I had been a lost man for 22 years. I just didn't know it. I had done everything that my church, that my parents, that people around me told me I should do. Even seminary professors told me I should do. I had done all the right things. I just didn't have the right one. And I still believe if in that moment I would have said, you know, I'm going to have to think about this, and I would have died, I would have split hell wide open. But God in His mercy pulled back the veil. So this morning, there's some of you, you need to quit playing. I know what you're doing because I did the same thing so many years. You're right now saying, yeah, but I've done that. I've done those things. I'm pr I know I've got the life of God in me. I mean, whenever I pray, I mean, I, I'm praying to Him. I know I'm doing those things. I did that. You see, I wasn't like those that Kyle went and talked with and taught this week. I wasn't a prisoner in an actual prison having broken laws. That wasn't me. I was much worse than that. I was a religious man. I'm going to spend eternity separated from God. But that day, I gave my life to Christ, September the 20th, 1981. And I was forever changed. I was transformed. I was born again. I became a new creation. My wife could testify the change. And I haven't gotten over it. I haven't, you know, lost any of it. I'm more, power, more fired up about Jesus than I was then. That's what the Spirit of God does. So today... I want us to just bow our heads. Father, I know that these kind of messages are sometimes the hardest because it's one thing to admit that we're lost whenever we've been living a vile and horrible life. It's pretty obvious. It's a whole other thing whenever making that confession means I could lose my reputation. Making that kind of confession means that I could come under some condemnation. I could be rejected by some people. Going and being public would be something that would be embarrassing. But Lord Jesus, you went public for us. So I just pray that today you'd move. Hey, I was here there sitting there, just you and God. Because Jesus entrusted himself to you. Is the life of God in you? And some of you may be saying, well, it once was. That isn't the way it works. You may have been zealous before, like Nicodemus. You may have been religious before. But have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Does the life of God dwell in you? 
Romans 8 says it this way. It says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, there's a lot of you believers here, and you know what I'm talking about. I hope you're praying right now. We're not fighting against people's decisions. We're fighting against an enemy that wants to send more people to hell. So, Father, I just want to pray that you would manifest in each of our hearts. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. We're going to stand in just a minute. We're going to be singing. Don't hesitate. Come. You say, well, I'm not for sure. Come anyway. Now, Brother David, I'm, I'm just, I, I think it doesn't matter. Come anyway. We'll help you let the Spirit clarify. Don't miss the moment. Father, I've done what I believe you told me to do. Now I just pray that we would respond in the same obedience. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together. You come.